Hey all, welcome to Circle of Tone. And today we have something that I have done a lot of research on, probably more than most aspects of my uh, videos, and that is speakers for your studio monitors. And there, I've found that there is one of the biggest misconceptions uh, on the online recording community is that you can't use home audio for your monitoring systems in the studio because there are special specific rules for monitors when it comes to this type of thing. Okay, so how did I come to this conclusion that I'm about to, uh, to spill the beans on? Because this could literally save you hundreds of dollars and get you much, much better results. This, I sound like one of those internet bloody marketers. This isn't, this is, this is legit information that I only got through experience and not through searching on forums and everything. Something is happening when it comes to Craigslist, Facebook, um, all sorts of, you know, local sales, okay? There is a lot of home audio gear out there. Now, there's a huge misconception that you can't use home audio for your studio because they're supposedly, you they're aimed at, you know, extended bass and uh, just hyped frequencies to make movies and things like that sound better. But what they don't know is a lot of audiophile companies, and I'm talking top of the range speakers, are the complete opposite of that. They are obsessed about actually what you get in the studio. They want you to hear what the actual mastering engineer is hearing. That is the end game. They want to hear, they want to be there as if the band is in the room, okay? And to do that, the companies that I'm about to cover, they go to obsessive lengths to get everything completely perfect when it comes to the, the frequency range. What people get mixed up with are the home audio, like 5.1 surround systems with subs and little tiny speakers and all the rest of it to get, that's not what the audio file game is all about. This video would be a non-starter if we had to pay audio file prices. But what you don't know is that there are little old ladies on Facebook that I put that are putting their dead husband's speakers out there for sale that she has no idea of, uh, that they're audio file equipment. We're talking good stuff like BMW and uh, you know Paradigm and things like that. And I've been picking up these speakers for like 40 or 50 bucks. And these speakers were worth thousands when they first came out. Now, there's lots of things to avoid. Avoid sound bars, obviously. Avoid subwoofers. Uh, avoid the 5.1 surround systems, you know, the small bookshelf speakers. You need to avoid those. You, what you do have are so many options. And let's get into it. When it comes to the audiophile world, there's snake oil, there's salesmanship, there's all sorts of pitfalls that you have to avoid, okay? But a lot of companies just have a good reputation. If these companies that are all vying for the same space, if they put out hyped, hyped speakers, they'd get laughed off the internet. They will get laughed off every forum because like, the, like what happened with Beats, uh, nobody really takes the Beats headphones seriously because of the extended bass range. You don't get that in the audiophile world. And I would not be pushing the audiophile world on you if you couldn't afford it. But like I say, I have just I just searched just, just now and there's Paradigm speakers for sale near me for like 60 bucks. Paradigm speakers. Do you think that M audio monitors have some sort of special fairy dust on them? It's a tweeter and a driver. That's it, you know? And and usually made in China, uh, not, they don't even sound good. And the, the argument is, yeah, but all monitors are flat. You know, studio monitors are flat. If that was the case, they would all sound the same. It's bullshit. The studio monitors aren't flat. They're about as varied and insane as, the, as home speakers. And there's, that's one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest myths in production. And in fact, the actual fact that uh, this is for studio monitors is more of a marketing aspect than anything else. So we've been, it's, it's the complete opposite. It's the complete opposite. 
And now with Craigslist and with uh, Facebook sales, I'll put a list of speakers to look out for in the uh, description. So uh, check that out. And uh, you just search, do a search yourself. In fact, come to the Circle of Town Facebook group and uh, tell me your zip code or post code or whatever. Um, and we can search your area, you know, see if we can find you something that uh, you can use and pick up for next to nothing. Some of the stuff I've found, I've, I've found uh, vintage B&W speakers, Bows and Wilkins. I've found uh, nice pinnacle speakers and all sorts of stuff. You want to avoid the Bose and, uh, you know, Sony and things like that. You, you want to get up there. So you're going to need a power amp and you're going to need a, you know, so you, so you can buy these top of the range speakers for a hundred bucks. And also, you know, uh, you can buy a power amp for a hundred bucks. So you're $200 and you've got a monitoring system that will utterly destroy M-Audio, KRK, any of the, you know, the, the affordable brands for less than half price of what they're putting out there. I mean, I've had, I've, I've had the Adam Audio monitors. I've had, uh, Genelec, I've had all sorts of stuff, and I prefer my Paradigm. And I've also had the cheap stuff, which is why I laugh at a lot of the videos out there which promote things like Behringer and M-Audio. After listening to the to their monitors, just the, say, claiming that they're flat, do you know how much bass I'm actually not hearing through that? This The, the reason I came to this conclusion, I'm kind of ranting, this is awesome. The, the reason I came to this conclusion is because I did have... Uh, a movie theater room, stereo one. And uh, I actually, it was a, it was a 5.1, but I had really good speakers in there and, uh, you know, a good amp. And I was like, why, why am I hearing more detail and more issues with my mix in my theater room than I am on my fancy studio monitors? It's because the actual speakers were better because I, I did the same thing. I saw, I did a bit of research when I was doing putting my theater room together. And uh, went on forums and, you know, listen to say, oh, these, these, these are good for the uh, entry level audio file stuff, you know, and I, I, I took it from that. I went kind of nuts and I bought all sorts of speakers, <laughs> but they were next to nothing. I know the resale value on them are good. One thing I need to warn you about, though, is white van speakers. Watch out for white van speakers. If the, if you don't recognize the uh, actual you need to Google whenever you whenever you see nice looking speakers. You need to Google the actual make and model of them, and uh, usually all the white van speakers are listed. What white van speakers are? It was an old scam, where people would hang outside high end audio places and or Best Buy or whatever, to be there with a usually with a van or a car or whatever, and they would ask people walking in say, "Hey, I've got uh, these speakers for sale because um, I got two pairs of them or whatever." And uh, here they are, and they'll show you a magazine with the speakers in them, listing them for like 3,000 bucks. You say, look, if you give me 300, 300 bucks, you can take them because uh, I've got two pairs of them and they ship me two by mistake. So, uh, and then people take them home and they sound like shit. But the actual, the funny thing is, I've had experience with white van speakers because uh, of a deal that I did on other speakers, which are right there. These are old, uh, funny enough, these are Celestian, I think. What are these? Funnily enough, these are old, uh, old vintage Jensen audio, uh, home audio speakers. So Jensen were in this market as well. They were great for mid range. They didn't give me enough on the top end because they had a bad tweeter. Well, they, you know, the tweeters worked, but they, there wasn't enough detail in them for me. But uh, I do use them to check mixes, and that's another point I want to get to. You can also get amplifiers, right? Say uh, Onkyo or old. Uh, Philips, old Sony's, old Sony's actually sound bloody good. You know, not amazing, but they, for 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 the purposes of uh, driving speakers compared to an M Audio, it's going to utterly destroy it. People say that a home theater is uh, is boosted as well. It's not. They have EQ on them if you need, but you can buy amp, buy amp like on my uh, Paradigm speakers. They have two different inputs on the back, one to drive the tweeter and one to drive the uh, the woofer. So you got you can use two different amps to drive the tweeter and drive the the uh, the woofer. So how much range does that give you to tune it to your room to tune it to to be flat? You get more range than you would with a fucking four hundred dollar M audio or you know a shit box. 
<laughs> and also, speaking of shit boxes, you can also use um, some of the speakers that you find, like I showed you some of the smaller speakers, you can use them as what we call grot boxes. So on a lot of, say, an on Onkyo uh, power amp, they are often got AB uh, speakers that you can actually swap to different speakers. So you can listen to it, say, if you buy Paradigm speakers for your good set. You leave it on that for the most time. With one push of a button, you can go to different speakers, grot boxes, and then that will give you a mix for people's iPhones, for people's laptops, and uh, you know, for people with crappier systems. So you'll hear what your mix sounds like uh, that way. Obviously, you're not, when it comes to powering them with audiophile equipment, that is usually expensive. So like Macintosh, things like that. And But sometimes they pop up for 500 bucks. You know, that is worth it. You know, I mean, for price to quality ratio, it's not, it's much like tube amps. You know, like my, my Bugera doesn't sound, you know, half as good as a 5150, even though it's half the price, you know, that type of thing. look into as well. So you can actually tune the uh, audio file systems to the room better than you can if you're just stuck with monitors with a couple of frequency range uh, shifts on them, if you're lucky. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's one. It's the best thing I ever did. The best thing I ever did, apart from this actually, apart from uh, an ISO booth so I can crank my amps. <laughs> But the, uh, the it's monitoring systems. There's also, uh, I want to give you some tips on, I'm going to go into more depth in this on another video, but there's things that you have to be aware of, like isolating the speakers themselves. You don't want to just put them on your desk. Um, that's just going to resonate through the whole thing. And uh, like this, I'll just give you an example. Okay, so why are you looking at part of my guitar and a closet? I just want to show you the uh, what happens with the transference of energy and uh, how putting your monitors on your actual desk causes the sound to change uh, because basically the, the sound travels through your monitor and the bass and the rest of the frequencies, they actually amplify your desk. So your desk is actually going to be acting as a speaker. And uh, this, this will illustrate my case. I'm just going to... Okay. That's what the guitar sounds like. Now if I just touch my closet, So you're going to get all sorts of overtones just from your desk. So that is why isolation is important. There's things that you can do um, if you're forced to, if you have to put them on a desk next to you. You can do things like um, you can cut squash balls in half, you know, the squashy squash balls, and uh, put them underneath them in the four corners and in the center. And that will act like one of those $500 isolation mat things that are fucking, they actually work. I know it sounds crazy but the isolation pads work but you can make your own ones just by putting squash balls underneath <laughs> you know life hack and uh, there's also um other things that you can do regarding uh you got to make sure that you cover walls a certain way so that waves don't create um like a slappy trebly uh, smearing corners have to be treated but there's cheap ways to do that as well i'll get that into that in a different uh in a different video because that is pretty involved i'll give you a quick example what i have are stands which are heavy duty that i put my speakers on because ideally your speaker has to be floating in the air right and obviously that's not possible so what i did is i got stands which are filled with sand so they're heavy as fuck and on the bottom of the stands there are um, spikes which go through my carpet into the sub into the concrete so then um, the power transference from those from the speakers plus pa a pad as well you know the, like the uh, technique I told you with the squash balls 
And I've actually put mine, because my stands are too high, I put the speakers on their side and you know, tilted them towards me. You have to have a triangle of equal distance between the two speakers and yourself. So you have to be in the middle of the, the peak of this triangle. And uh, also treat above you, treat behind, especially if, if your speakers have a port on the back and they're close to the wall, you really got to watch out for that because that base is going to like pluff out like a cloud on your back wall and create all sorts of shitty, uh, you know, artifacts. So there's lots of things to discuss. I'll get into that in a different video, but that's just type of the things that I've done. Uh, you got to put them on stands. Just don't put them on your desk, basically. Uh, if you have to, uh, you know, try and isolate them as much as you can to stop the whole thing from becoming an extension of, your, of the, the speaker. So I love it. Uh, if you research some of these companies, like uh, B&W speakers, not not the, the the car manufacturer. I think it's Bose, Bowers and Wilkins or something. Look at this guy. This is the type of obsessive guy that works on. I'm going to keep on using the term audiophile. I know that everybody hates that term, but that's what it is. Look at this. These are the people that you want to be trusting your sound to. Within these doors, a project has been taking shape that draws on the past and combines it with radical new thinking to produce a loudspeaker that gets closer than any other to the sound of the original performance. The story begins with Lawrence Dickey. Dick had long felt that the natural world held lessons for us in the pursuit of completely transparent sound reproduction. He and his colleagues at Stenning had already demonstrated that matrix cabinet construction, a rigid honeycomb structure, could deal with the problem of internal cabinet resonances. This time, not a honeycomb, but the humble garden snail provided the inspiration. He got so obsessed about, you know, I, I talked about the isolating the actual speaker from the interactions with the, the room and interactions with the cabinet itself. He used the design of a snail because what happens when, if you shoot frequencies that you want to get rid of away, okay? What he's done is it's almost like a tube. So, so you have all this pressure and frequencies going through this tube and curling around. And in the tube, you have kind of like, I'm not sure if it's a foam substance or something that will slowly dampen it until it becomes nothing. So all you're hearing, instead of hearing the resonance and the bouncing around of all the sound, it's actually being negated. And you, then you have the actual, you, you, more, you, all you hear is the movement of the coil and the speaker and the, and the tweeter and the rest of it, which are obviously tuned per, to perfection. And then you get less of the chaos that you get from the cabinet and the rest of it. So these are the levels of details these guys are going for. Do you think they are saying, hey, bro, hey, bro, bring me the bass, bro? Do you think they're saying that? Or do you think they are going to fucking insane lengths to make sure that everything is flat and perfect and they're recreating what they hear in the studio? Where are we? In a studio. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the people that say, oh, you can't use home audio gear for in your studio, then the next breath, they say, uh, how often have you taken your mix into your car and then heard it sounds completely different? Uh, remember I was talking about isolating, isolating the sound? Cars tend to be, you know, unless you've got a Jeep or something, tend to be perfect listening environment because they are soundproofed against the road. So they become almost like a perfect chamber for listening to music in. And then all those little tiny crappy speakers, along with woofers, it's all tuned to sound good in a car. And then, or if you go and listen to it in your front room, you know, and like I do on YouTube, this is how I this is how I got to this conclusion. Because I would listen to it on my monitors and my headphones, my studio headphones, and then take it into my bedroom, listen to it in, you know, on a nice system in there. I got nice systems in each room. And I was hearing so many mistakes, so many mixed mistakes. And it's because I had really good speakers. KEF speakers are actually my favorite gem that I've discovered in the, you know, the low level audiophile world. And they sound absolutely amazing and they are so transparent. And, the, you know, this is how I come up to this conclusion. I've tried the Pinnacle, the Paradigm, the, the B&Ws. I have them all. I had the, the KEF speakers. 
the old vintage Jensen's, old JBL's. I've tried them all. And this is how I come to the conclusion. I'm not just saying, you know, oh, it's audio files, so it must be good. I've just gone through the gauntlet myself. And I've gone through the gauntlet of, you know, uh, prosumer monitors and entry-level monitors as well. And this is how I come to these conclusions. Never mix with uh, headphones. Never express, do not get your tones with headphones. You know, I, I see way too many bedroom guys uh, using headphones versus the mixers. The headphones, no matter how good they are, they're not going to give you uh, accurate bass. And they're often not going to give you not any, the only real stuff they cover, in my opinion, is upper mids. They can, you know, give you a decent example of what's going on with symbols and things. But the rest of it, I don't know, man. Lots of, uh, you want to check reference with headphones. You always check the reference. So once you're done on, once you've put it through your speakers, once you put it through your grot box, then listen to how headphones and other stuff might pop out at you. So I also have to backtrack a bit and talk about uh, powering them. You can get, uh, I, I use an Alasis power amp. I'm not that happy with it, but I'm used to it. You know, it's an old vintage one, huge transformers. Transformers are important. I mean, have you ever tried to lift up a non or a Sony or, you know, just a, a decent uh, home receiver? Because things are bloody heavy. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the, the the iron that's inside them. And some of these cheap monitors you can pick up with one finger, the amps that are inside them are pretty, about as entry level as it gets. And you, I mean, everybody thinks that these monitors are so great, but there's limitations to putting amps inside of speakers, you know? People are selling them and they can't sell them because not many people are clued up on it. There are a lot of people don't know that, that uh, you know, paradigm speakers are good and they put them online and nobody will buy them locally because you can't ship them because they're heavy. Um, so yeah, life hack, speaker hack, Trust, trust old Gibbsy on this one. <laughs> so if you like these types of vids, I've got more money saving things uh, where I'm going to start talking about $20 microphones, uh, used microphones that actually are great alternatives uh, or additions to SM57. A lot of people are fatigued with the sound of an SM57, okay? Practically every guitarist uses it. You know, 90% of guitarists use you, what you hear is an SM57. Same frequencies over and over again, because there's a narrow band when it comes to the SM57s. So I'm bringing out a video soon on a, probably a dozen alternatives or for, for that. And we're not talking crap, $20 crap. We're talking made in Japan, made in America, made in the UK. Little secret microphones that I use all the time. So this one is... The, have you heard Entombed? Early Entombed? This microphone, pick it up for like 30 bucks. That's why you come to Circular Tone. All right, chaps, if you are interested in this type of thing, please subscribe, please like. We uh, People my age don't share, which is why my channel's dead. But, uh, you know, it's something I got to take on the chin. Uh, if you come to the Facebook group, uh, recently I'm working on Carcass, trying to recreate the tone of Carcass. So as a bit of fun, Carcass uh, heart, heart work has three amps on it, okay? One of which is a 5150. So I'm in the process of adding the other two amps, but I thought I'd just show the group what just a 5150 would sound like with the, using the Carcass' setup. Because I have their exact microphone, speaker, amp setup. Well, apart from my amp is a clone. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to hear what Carcass sounds like with just a 5150 from the heart work era, Come to Circular Tone on Facebook, uh, search for it and join. We're over a thousand strong and uh, lots of interesting stuff going on there. So have a good one. I've been knowing. Circular Tone.